Okay, so this is a uh, preview video for those who are walking through this poem, reading this poem, maybe for the first time. Um, these preview videos are meant to sort of ground you in a chapter before reading it. Uh, you can also read it, uh, watch these after you read it. You don't have to watch them at all, actually. It's a free country. But so uh, this chapter, uh, Book 11, uh, chapter Emily Wilson titles The Dead, um, to me is one of the most sort of revolutionary, unbelievable chapters. And I'll have, I'm going to walk through sort of literally what's happening now. And in my books, eight to 12, uh, nine to 12 sort of takeaways in my presentation on that later, um, I'll give some more specific reflections on um, just some of the problems uh, this chapter presents um, for the reader, but also for the sort of value system of of this uh, of this entire epic i think this chapter makes things far more interesting and complicated so again as i've said during these takeaway presentations uh during during these i'm sorry these introductory presentations have your copy of emily wilson's the odyssey handy you have a pen and uh annotate as you go so I think something that's good to do before this chapter, uh, and I think we've read enough of the epic now that sometimes a really good thing to do when you're reading a difficult book, once you're in the sort of value system and you know the characters and you sort of know behavioral patterns within the book, is before reading, make some predictions. It isn't so much about whether your predictions come true, but thinking about what might happen can ground you in the reading experience in a really interesting way. I think we do this during movies. Um, and, you know, Netflix shows sort of intuitively, we think, you know, we start imagining, is that character going to die? These characters are going to get married. And it isn't so much about whether or not those things happen. It just, it, it's a way of thinking about what's already happened in the book and we extrapolate going forward. So we know based on the previous chapter, book 10, that Odysseus, uh, Xerxes gives him the directions to get to Hades, to the underworld. So. Here's a few things to think about and to maybe talk about with classmates before looking at book 11. One, this is personal, uh, but I think it's really important when reading old difficult books to not make them mere intellectual exercises. That this book probably came from a, a writer's guts. You know what I mean? Um, Homer didn't write this for the purpose of students to write thesis papers 3,000 years later. Not that that's bad, but it's not the sole purpose of the book. And the fact of the matter is that all of us probably have lost people in our lives. And it's sort of interesting to think, you know, what person in our life would we want to talk to again? And what would that conversation be like? What would we want to ask them? And conversely, what do you think loved ones that we've lost, what do you think they would want to ask us, those of us who are still alive? So that's number one. Think about that. Number two, think about in the beginning of chapter 11. What do you think Odysseus cares about the most? And we know that the Iliad, to reduce it, uh, is largely about kleos or the pursuit of glory, that immortality that comes from a heroic uh, behavior in battle. And Odysseus seems to largely be about uh, nostos or home or a return home. Um, but Odysseus is also a warrior, and as is seen in 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 the chapter with the Cyclops, he does care about Kleos. He does care about his name being known. He can't be no man. So I don't know. It might be worth considering what are some things Odysseus cares about the most. Start with the return home, but see what else comes up. And third, um, what are your predictions other than that? What are your predictions for this chapter? Who is dead in Odysseus's life that he knows about? He's obviously going to talk to Tiresias, the sort of soothsayer of Thebes, fortune teller, future predictor. So make some predictions about that. And then who else is dead in Odysseus's life and what might they say to him? So these are some things maybe to journal about or talk about before entering book 11. Okay, so first of all, the sort of uh, Christian notion of hell, not that that's one thing, it depends on which Christian you're talking about, but the traditional notion of hell is separation from God forever. Um, and hell is a, uh, hell has to do with one's moral status upon death. So there's, you know, in, in a sort of Catholic eschatology, there's 
heaven, hell, and, and purgatory, right? Well, in ancient Greece, there's Hades, and Hades is simply a receptacle for all the dead people. And there is degrees of comfort in Hades, but it isn't the same thing as heaven, hell, and purgatory. So you're going to notice people that die foolishly go to Hades, really noble, heroic warriors go to Hades, everyday women go to Hades. So Hades is where dead people go. And I just think that's an important distinction to make. So first, have book 11 open and go to page, go to the bottom of page 280, line 50. And interestingly, the first person Odysseus meets is the last person in Odysseus's life to die. The young warrior Elpinor, who, as we know from the previous chapter, gets drunk, stupidly sleeps on a roof, which we don't do when we're drunk, uh, falls off the roof and, and dies. This incredibly unheroic death. This is after years of combat, right? He dies this way. So what is the problem? Well, Elpinor has died without a funeral or without a burial. So it's interesting. It's interesting that considering all the incredibly important characters we're about to meet, we start with this seemingly unimportant one, but something very human is uh, sort of lives in this passage on, on page 281. And uh, on line 71, he says to Odysseus, please, my Lord, remember me. Do not go on and leave me there in the land of Xerxes, right, Aia? unburied, abandoned, without tears or lamentation, or you will make the gods enraged at you, burn me with all my arms and heap a mound beside the gray salt sea, so in the future people will know of me in my misfortune, and fix into the tomb the oar I used to row with my companions when I lived. Um, my father died this past year, and because of quarantine, we couldn't have the wake and funeral right away, and I think many of you listening to this maybe have lost loved ones more recently. And it's still a very human thing. Now, a, 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 my father was Catholic. A Catholic funeral in 2021 is certainly different than a, a, a pagan Greek funeral 3,000 years ago. But this notion of needing ritual, of needing closure, is seen even in this minor character. So I think that's pretty interesting. Now, maybe the most important set of sort of concrete pieces of data, of information, can be found on page 282 of the Wilson translation. And please, as I always tell you, bracket or underline or highlight as we read together. Go to line 100. So Xerxes has said, you have to talk to Tiresias. Now, a lot of this chapter refers to a lot of characters from other stories in ancient Greece. Tiresias is a really important story in the Oedipus plays written by Sophocles. But for our purposes, he's someone who knows the future of characters knows the future of people, even from beyond the grave. So the ghost of Tiresias tells Odysseus six specific things that have to happen. Okay, so make sure you mark the six specific things. So I'm going to read this entire chunk here, this entire large paragraph, starting on line 100. Odysseus, this is Tiresias talking to Odysseus. You think of going home as honey sweet, but gods will make it bitter. Okay, it doesn't start good. I think Poseidon will not cease to feel incensed because you blinded his dear son. Okay, so information number one, hard journey home. I actually wrote this in the margin, one hard journey home. He says, you have to suffer, but you can get home if you control your urges and your men. Interesting that it's in that order, your urges and your men. Turn from the purple depths and sail your ship towards the island of Thrinacia. Okay, so number one is, it's a hard journey ahead. Number two, go to Thrinacia, and that's where the sun god lives. So that's the second step. There you'll find grazing cows and fine fat sheep belonging to the god who sees and hears all things, the sun god. If you leave them be, you leave them alone, keeping your mind fixed on your journey home. Nostalgia, right? You may still get to Ithaca, despite great losses. But if you hurt these cows, and we know from the very first page of the entire poem in book one, they killed the sun god's cattle. We know this already. If you hurt these cows, I see disaster for your ship and your men. If you yourself escape, you will come home late and exhausted in a stranger's boat, having destroyed your men. 
We know again Odysseus left for the Trojan War with 12 ships, with 20 to 30 men per ship. And Tiresias says, if you eat the sun, God's cattle, you'll be home late, you'll be exhausted, you won't be on your own ship, and all the other men will be dead. Ooh. And you will find invaders eating your supplies at home, courting your wife with gifts. Okay, the hits keep on coming. Number three, we have hard journey ahead is one. You're going to go to the land of the sun god. Number two, here's number three. Then you will match the suitor's violence and kill them all inside your hall through tricks or in the open with sharp bronze weapons. So number three, you will kill the suitors. Here's number four. When those men are dead, you will have to go away and take an oar to people with, okay. So number four, after you kill the suitors, you have to leave home again. And then there's some specific information about where he has to go. And it's interesting, there's no city mentioned. Uh, it says, take an oar to people with no knowledge of the sea who do not salt their food. That's the equivalent of saying to someone, you know, in, uh, on the, in Massachusetts, you have to go to someone so far inland that they never would have even seen the sea. So this is a way of saying really far away. They never saw a ship's red prow nor oars, the wings of boats. I prophesy the signs of things to come. When you meet somebody, a traveler who calls the thing you carry on your back, a winnowing fan, then fix that oar in earth and make sign, fine sacrifices to Poseidon, a bull and stud boar. Okay, so over and over again, we're told, go really far away. And go really far away means a few things. They'll, they'll never have seen the sea. And more specifically, they're going to look at an oar, which you use for rowing in the sea, and they're going to think it's a winnowing fan. They're, they're so clueless about the ocean that they're going to think the oar is actually a farming implement. So number five, this is number one is hard journey ahead. Number two is go to the land of the sun god. Number three, you're going to have to go home and kill the suitors. Number four, you're going to have to leave on another journey far away. Five, uh, offer sacrifice to the gods. And then six, then you will go home, line 132, then you will go home, Ithaca, and offer holy hecatombs to all the deathless gods who live in heaven, each in order. That includes Poseidon. Think about it. Gentle death will come to you far from the sea of comfortable old age. Your people flourishing so will be. So you have a long journey. And then six is a final return home. So these are super specific predictions Tiresias gives. And, you know, be mindful of the fact this entire chapter also, just like the previous one, is told in the court of the Phaeacians, who Odysseus just met, right? to King Alcinous and his queen and all the people in court. Also imagine what Odysseus must have felt hearing this. And again, a conversation to have, you know, either with yourself or with students, how much of your future would you want to know? How much of the trials you have to endure in your, would you want to know? Odysseus is forced to know all these things. So that's kind of an interesting human conversation to have as well. But anyway, these are the super specific predictions Tiresias gives. And then one of the most heartbreaking moments, go to line 155. Um, Odysseus meets his mother. He doesn't know his mother's dead. He's been gone 20, almost 20 years, right? And actually go to line, um, Odysseus asks the logical questions, right? How's my father? Um, how did you come to die, mom? And... Uh, how's my wife? She does confirm that, uh, you know, she does confirm that Penelope is remaining strong and faithful, that Telemachus is, you know, going to meetings and, you know, being an adult in a way. And curiously, uh, and, and, and Laertes in a heartbreaking way, the father is just mourning. He's sleeping with the slaves. He's sleeping in ashes and leaves. But go to line 197. She says this really heartbreaking thing to her son, Odysseus. She says, that's why I met my fate and died. The goddess did not shoot me in my home, aiming with gentle arrows. That was their sense of how people died. Nor did sickness suck all the strength out from my limbs with long and cruel wasting. No. And think of this as a child hearing this from your mother in the afterlife. It was missing you, Odysseus, my sunshine, your sharp mind and your keen heart that took sweet life from me. 
And then to add to the heart, I mean, can you imagine hearing that from your one of your parents in the afterlife? He tries to hug her and he can't. He tries over and over again. It's like the end of stave one of the Christmas carol where, where there's, a, there's a ghost trying to help a poor woman and for all eternity he can perceive her need, but for all eternity he can't assist her. Um, really, really depressing. So this is really important, really easy to skim over. So I want you to mark the bottom of page 286, all of page 287, 288, 289. This can read like filler. Epics often have, classical epics have catalogs. They'll catalog things like ships going to battle. There's a famous catalog of ships in the Iliad. Here we have a catalog of dead women. And some of these are stories you don't know about. Think of going to a friend's Thanksgiving party and throughout the day, various relatives show up and you're quickly introduced to them. And all you have is their name and little tidbits and you don't really know who they are, but you get the sense that everybody around them knows who they are because it's you know their family. This is probably like what it's going to feel like when you hear this. You're going to hear about all these women, some of whom are really famous, some of whom are less famous, some of whom have famous children or famous fathers. Um, maybe a conversation to have is, why include all these women, right? So maybe that's something to talk about. Um, then, wisely, I think, Homer returns us to the original frame of the story, which is we're getting Odysseus, you know, telling the story to Alcinous and his wife. And we have various court people here, and we have Demodocus, the, the poet, this is where all these stories are being told. These, this isn't happening in real time. It's a flashback. And in line 336, Arete, the queen, says, Phaeacians, look at him. What a tall, handsome man and what a mind. He's a special guest, but all of you share in our rank as lords. Do not send him away too fast. When he leaves, you must be generous. Odysseus breaks down and, and is crying here. Um, and Odysseus... And Alcinous have a conversation about, you know, whether we keep telling the story or whether, you know, we take a break. And Alcinous says, um, you know, I'd love to hear on, in the middle of page 291, line 373, he says, uh, come now, tell me, 371, come now, tell me, he says to Odysseus. If you saw any spirits of your friends who went with you to Troy and undertook the grief and pain of war. This again goes back to the fact that Alcinous, while a good king, is, um, as Jonathan Shea says, is a tourist in suffering. He hasn't really suffered like a warrior has in war. Um, think of the pain it would take for a warrior to re-engage with the ghost of those who he fought and bled with. And this is what he's been asked to do as a sort of entertainment. Okay, so go to line 389 on page 272. And we get this story again, which is a weird, demented, twisted, sad chorus within the entire epic poem. It's Agamemnon, the king of the Greeks, the number one sort of leader on the team of Odysseus and Achilles. And he fights heroically and... They ended up winning because of the Trojan War, and he returns home to his wife, Clytemnestra, only to have his homecoming be ruined because Clytemnestra's lover, Aegisthus, kills him. So Odysseus and he have this conversation starting on line 389 and going all the way to line 467. And I guess what I would like you to, to encourage you to think about is uh the notion of various ways warriors return home from war that odysseus is still imagining what returning home would be like but we know warriors coming home from world war ii we see famous pictures of warriors being embraced and kissed and ticker tape parades we know that warriors returning home from vietnam were spat at and called baby killer we know there's a variety of ways that warriors can return home this would be one of the worst to return home to the one who's supposed to love you the most having deceived you um go to line 428 it's on page 293. think of this agamemnon is telling odysseus who hasn't returned home yet 
He says, there's mo no more disgusting act than when a wife betrays a man like that. Back in my head, I think. What about a man betraying his wife? But anyway, that woman formed to plot to murder me, her husband. When I got back home, I thought I would be welcomed. Again, I wrote in my margin here, Vietnam echo. I thought I would be welcomed, at least by my slaves and children. She has such an evil mind, Clytemnestra, his wife, that she poured down shame on her own head and on all other women, even good ones. Um, and Odysseus sort of affirms him. They're having a little bro fest, macho moment, you know, curse her. Zeus always brought disaster to the house of Atreus through women. Um, and Agamemnon does sort of recover on 441. He says this terrible thing. So you must never treat your wife too well. Do not let her know everything you know. Tell her some things, hide others. But then he recovers and says, but your wife will not kill you, Odysseus. And he, he sort of vouches for Penelope. Um, next, and to me, this is, I've been thinking about this in a lot of epic poetry in Beowulf, which is kind of an epic, in Paradise Lost, which very much is an epic, um, with the Iliad and definitely with the Odyssey. I'm thinking epic poetry has uh, sort of beliefs, epic poems themselves believe certain things are noble and true. And in something like Beowulf and in something like the Odyssey, and in something like the Iliad, that belief is a warrior's belief that fighting heroically and nobly in battle leads one to a sort of immortality. In, in Greek, the words kleos, we discussed this, glory, that after you're dead, your name will be sung heroically forever by the, by the bards, by the poets. So who does Odysseus meet? He meets Achilles, the ultimate Superman, the ultimate war hero of the Greeks. He is the one who, you know, Odysseus would hold up as the paradigm, the apotheosis of, of heroism. So he says on page 295, line 482, he says, no one, he says to Achilles, no one's luck was ever better than yours, nor ever will be. Odysseus says to Achilles, in your life, we Greeks respected you as we do gods. And now that you're here, you have great power among the dead. Achilles, you should not be bitter at your death. Hint, never say that to someone when they're dead. If you ever get to talk to a dead person. Listen to this reply. But Achilles replied, Odysseus, you must not comfort me for death. And here's the big line. Underline this, highlight, asterisk, star, everything. I would, Achilles says, I would prefer to be a workman hired by a poor man on a peasant farm than rule as king of all the dead. And then he switches and says, tell me about my son, which Odysseus does, because Achilles' son was in the, was in the Trojan horse and he hears all these great stories about his son. Think about what Achilles just said. This will be part of my takeaway presentation, but this is something you have to have a conversation about if you're reading this in a class or maybe you have to journal about if you're reading this on your own. What does Achilles telling this to Odysseus do to Odysseus? Here's this belief system of what heroism is that we all believed, right, as young warriors. But I'm telling you as a dead guy, it's better to be alive in the worst possible circumstances than to be the noblest hero among the dead. Think about what that would mean to Odysseus. So something to, something to consider is what does, what are the two most important lessons that Odysseus learns in book 11? I think when we think about the first four books as the education of Telemachus, it's my contention that in book 11, book 11 is the most significant education for Odysseus. And I think there's numerous lessons. And by lessons, I think I don't mean he learns things definitively, like, like a chapter in a math or science book. I think to a large extent, Odysseus maybe has a sort of a particular way of looking at the world, and that way has been complicated in Book 11. But anyway, maybe something to discuss or, or reflect on is what are the most important lessons he learns in Book 11. I hope this uh, introductory presentation on Book 11 is helpful. I hope you Read book 11 now with a little bit more focused eye and happy reading.